morning, everybody. Please sit down. We well, welcome back this morning, Val. I think most of you know. Um, she usually gives a lovely service, and so welcome, Val. Thank you. Oh, you haven't heard today's yet, so <laughs> reserve judgment. Well, it's lovely to be with you and uh, to express my welcome on behalf of the church here that you're here, and it's great to see you all. We're going to do something that might be a little bit unusual for you, I don't know. I don't know whether you've experienced this before. It's called a Methodist love feast. Now, when you look at it, parts of it, you'll think, oh, that's a bit like communion and it's a bit like lots of other things. But let me tell you a little bit about the history of a love feast. I looked it up in Wikipedia, because that must be right, mustn't it? <laughs> Methodists also practice love feasts, it says, often quarterly, I think that's a bit of a stretch, as well as on the evenings of major feast days. They're also held during camp meetings. Anybody remember a camp meeting? Oh, I'm alone. Uh-oh. In Methodist theology, love feasts are a means of grace and converting ordinance these are the words of John Wesley, by the way, so we'll, we'll unpack them a bit later. Believed to be an apostolic institution. Right, that whole mouthful just means that it started in Jesus' time. One account from July 1776 talked about the attendees' experience of new birth and entire sanctification at a love feast. I'm not expecting anybody to talk about entire sanctification today, so you're all right. But we never know what we're going to experience with God, do we? And so we're going to have this love feast today when we will share the love feast cake. <clears throat> and underneath our, excuse me, <clears throat> foil, we have the love feast cake, which I've made to a recipe from Middlesmoor in the Yorkshire Dales. And, yay! A love feast bread recipe that was used in the time of John Wesley. Now the cake is not from the time of John Wesley. I made that yesterday. You'll be pleased to know. But the recipe is. So we're, we're doing a bit of history, but in a new way. So we're begin, going to begin with our first hymn, singing and um, helping us to think about this gospel feast that we're invited to. Come sinners to the gospel feast.
in keeping with doing something that is traditionally Methodist, that hymn was written by Charles Wesley. I guess you could tell by the old-fashioned language. In the modern Methodist hymn book, they have changed some of the words so that we don't talk about mankind now, but humankind. But the, the, the message is still there in terms of not just calling sinners. We don't only talk about sinners, but we also talk about witnesses. And we talk about all of humanity needing that gospel message, that gospel feast. So, a little bit more about the gospel feast that we're following today. The love feast, or agape, is a Christian fellowship meal that reminds us of the meals that Jesus shared with his disciples during his ministry. The service expresses the sharing, the belonging, the fellowship enjoyed within the body of Christ. Now the love feast in common with other acts of worship includes prayer and praise and scripture reading and preaching and the mutual fellowship. But it also includes a time of prepared testimony. So don't panic, I'm not going to jump on anyone and say, can you brother or sister give us your testimony? Um, it's all prepared. Um, and also the sharing of the love feast cake and the loving cup. Now, in the old days, the loving cup would have been a single bowl or cup that we would have passed around. But in these post-COVID days, we're going to make use of our little individual glasses. And we share water in those. So let's now come to a time of prayer together. Let us pray. Loving God, we are here in the name of Christ. We come to bow our heads, to lift up our hearts, and to offer you our praise. We come to confess Jesus Christ as Lord, to enthrone him in our lives and to offer him our commitment. We come to seek his will, to hear his word and receive his blessing. Loving God, we praise you for all you have done through Jesus his revealing of your great love and glory, his obedience and faithfulness even to the cross itself, his victory over death, and his exaltation to be by your side, his promise to come again as King of kings and Lord of lords help us as we worship to recognize christ is here amongst us help us to glimpse your glory through him to hear his voice to feel his love and to see more clearly where we can serve him in the needs of our world. Help us to bear his name faithfully and live each day to the glory of his name. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the features of early Methodist church worship and meetings, uh, whether they were house group meetings or church meetings or meetings in the open air, was the use of testimony in worship. And it is particularly central to the love feast. And ordinarily, the preacher would ask a member of the congregation to give their testimony. 
But this often fills people with anxiety, not to say fear and stress. And so, um, with the testimony today, I'm going to tell you mine. So I'm sorry you're hearing a lot of my voice. That's the only thing. You would have had a different voice to listen to. So I come from a non-Christian family who didn't generally attend church except for baptisms and weddings and funerals, but they called themselves C of E on any form that they filled in, if asked. I was sent, packed off to Sunday school on my own when I was about age eight, with my two pence, two old pence, um, to put in the collection. And sometimes I forgot and it was still in my pocket when I got home. And I was always pleased to learn the memory verses. We used to have to do memory verses. And they would give us a little coloured tract, if you remembered the verse, to go into your Bible. I wish I still had them, actually. I don't know where they went. Later in life, uh, my mother became involved with the Mormons, the Church of Latter-day Saints. And so I was uh, duly dragged along to those meetings. And I seemed to understand the things they were talking about, even as a child of only 10 or so, but not really having any experience of my own. I kind of sat in the audience, as it were. In my teenage years, I went along with friends from school to a local youth club that was held in the local Anglican church. Now, it was one of these um, daughter churches of a, of a big old Victorian pile up the road. So the daughter church was simply a hall that had a holy bit up the front. And the holy bit was, was cordoned off when the youth club were in. So we obviously weren't holy. Um, and it's, it's funny, you sort of got used to this idea that there was this you know, sacred bit just behind the doors. Well, one evening at our youth club, which was loud, you know, we had disco music and we had ping pong and all sorts of things going on. We were joined by a young curate who was new to the parish and he went round and he chatted to us and sat down and had a drink with us and he said, um, well, okay then, why don't you lot go to church? <laughs> lot of looking at feet. <laughs> Awkward. Um, and we said, well, do you know, it's full of old ladies with hats. <laughs> and it's, it's, it doesn't have anything to say to us. It's not, not relevant to us. And he said, how do you know if you haven't been? I dare you, this is a group of teenagers, I dare you to come to Evensong. He was going to be preaching. Well, you can't do that to a group of youngsters, can you? You know, you can't, you can't, they can't, they can't let you get away with that to say, I dare you and not do something. So a group of us decided we'd show him. We'd, we'd turn up en masse, sit at the back, arms folded, you know, give him the eye. I don't remember what the curate preached about, but on a, that night, seven of us had conversion experiences. And those seven, all of us, are still involved in church life to this day, and that's 40 years later. For me, it was, and still is to a large extent, all about the hymns. If I don't remember what the preacher says, I quite often remember the words of a hymn when I go home and be going through my mind, or I will have got a message from a hymn. It's not to say that I don't listen to the preachers, but on that particular service where we went, thinking that we were going to give them trouble, we sang, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And when we got to the verse about, were the whole realm of nature mine, it were a present far too small, I just remembered in my mind's eye a recent trip, it had actually been a school trip, when I had seen mountains for the first time. And you're thinking, wow, even a mountain is too small a present to give to God. Isn't that amazing? It just it completely blew my mind. And I thought, wow, this God who wants to have a relationship with me is so amazing 
that even giving him a mountain would be too small. And so that evening I went home and got ready for bed and I felt, you know, I ought to pray, didn't I? If I'm, I'm, a, if I'm a Christian now, I ought to pray. But I didn't know how to because nobody had said anything about how you pray or what to say. So I started off with the good old school one, you know, our Father, which are in heaven. And got a little way through it and burst into tears and then started to say, look, God, I've no idea what to say to you, but here I am. Here I am. I want to find out more. I want to be close to you. Now that's not to say it carried on being easy. Within a few days after that experience, we were seeing on television for the first time, I believe, images of starving people in Biafra. It's not a country now, but it was a, a situation then when we'd never seen those sorts of images on our television screens before. And I can remember walking along the main street after school, talking to Jesus and saying, do you know, this is too much, this is too painful, I can't bear it. Now that I belong to you, and everybody is my brother and sister, my sibling. All these people are my siblings. How, how, can, how can I watch them suffering like that? And, and God, how do you? I said, I can't do it. Let me go. Let me go. Let me take back my promise. I want to be able to switch it off. And Jesus said to me, I will never leave you. Feeling the hurt is the part you need to play in my world. Stay with me. Don't look away from them. You may look away from me, Jesus said, but I will never look away from you. I will always be with you. And so that's my testimony of the beginning of my journey. There's lots of other stages along the way that I could tell you about, but we would be here until well after lunchtime, so let's not do that. But it's just that beginning of a journey that in some ways was such a simple thing to do. And who'd have thought, you know, a curate saying to us, I dare you go to church, would have had such an impact on so many people. But also, we don't need special words. We don't need to be a special type of person. We don't need to be especially clever or especially able to do any particular thing. God takes us as we are and says, I won't leave you. So I'd like us to sing our next hymn now, which is Only by Grace Can We Enter.
going to hear our Bible reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you. This Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. The greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the good Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the word of the Lord. It's interesting, isn't it, that the passages in the Bible where Jesus is trying to be caught out, where people are um, trying to trip him up, often give us the most meaningful and the deepest of our, I suppose if you're going to use a posh word, you call it theology, but our understanding about God and about religion. And Jesus is actually here laying down a definition of religion. He's basically saying religion consists in loving God. Now, I don't know about you, I cringe when I hear the word religion. And I cringe especially if somebody says to me, are you religious? Because I want to say no, but. Because people's idea of religious can, can be very wide, can't it? It can be very strange and also encompass a lot of unusual ideas. But Jesus here is quoting from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy, part of a um, prayer called the Shema, which is basic and the essential creed of Judaism. It's the sentence with which every Jewish service opens, and it's the first text that every Jewish child learns off by heart. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And this is what Jesus is referring to and all his hearers would have known it. And he's saying that it means that to God we've got to give total love. A love that dominates our emotions a love that directs our thoughts and also causes our actions. All religion, if you think religion is talking about our spiritual life, starts and ends with a total commitment of our life to God. And the second commandment that Jesus quotes comes also from the Old Testament, from Leviticus. Our love of God must be shown in our love for other people. The fact is, we are all made in the image of God and that's what makes us lovable. We are all lovable. Isn't that great? I spent years of my life thinking nobody could ever love me because I wasn't pretty or clever or good enough or all those things that we go through in our minds. Don't we have this little voice? I, well, I do. I hope I'm not the only one, maybe I am, that who has a little voice that sometimes says, oh, you, you twit, you shouldn't have done that. Or, oh dear, another failure, you know. When are you going to learn? Or, as, as my mother used to say, when are you going to grow up? Probably never. But actually, you know, God loves us made us exactly the way we are and loves us and we're lovable to each other because we're made in the image of God and that's what we've committed to isn't it we've committed to love God so therefore we're committed to love each other if you take away the love of God 
It's funny, Sheila and I are in the car here talking about how difficult it must be for people who don't have a faith, who don't have a belief in life, especially when trouble comes. And if you take away the love of God and you look at human nature, you can become very disillusioned, very pessimistic, very angry. I don't know if you've noticed, there's a lot of angry, pessimistic, disillusioned people about at the moment. The love of humanity is firmly grounded in the love of God. It's not enough to be a humanist. To be truly religious is to love God and to love those who God made in his image. To love God and to, other, to love other people. Not in some vaguely sentimental way. We're not talking about love that you see on the adverts. You know, you buy a box of chocolates or a packet of uh, flowers. This is about total commitment. This is about devotion. We have to show our commitment to God in devotion to God and our practical service to other people. Now those ideas aren't straight out of my head. They were some of the ideas from a commentary by William Barclay. And he wrote it in the 1920s and 30s. And it still seems very fresh at this moment. This idea of people being disillusioned and pessimistic with humanity. And thinking, like I did as a teenager, that the church has got nothing to say about this. Actually, we have, we've got the answer. We have everything to say about this. It's about loving God. Faith in God. And we're going to think and experience that a bit more as we come to our love feast. And so we're going to sing a hymn. I'm afraid it's another old-fashioned hymn, and it may be one that you don't know very well. It's Come Let Us Sweetly Join, which is Charles Wesley's only hymn that was specifically written for a love feast. So I think maybe we might need to play it through once so we get the how it goes.
one will know better next time, isn't it? I thought actually unusually for a Charles Wesley hymn, it had a relatively modern sounding tune, which unlike the, a lot of the sort of Victorian verses where you know where they're going to go, this one catches us out in a couple of places, doesn't it? But thank you very much. It's the words that I picked it for. And so it, it's about that sweetly joining in this gospel feast. Now we're coming to the love feast. And what we're going to do is pass around the love feast cake. Um, stay in your seats and pass it along to your neighbour on the plates. Let them and you take a piece of the cake and hold on to it. Okay? So this is not one of those grab and gobble moments. <laughs> hold on to the cake until everybody's got a piece of cake and we're then going to sing a grace, basically, before we eat. Um, so hold on to your piece of cake. That's the main thing I should say to you. And I think I have a couple of people who are going to just come and help me by taking a plate to the beginning of the row. Who needs gluten free? Is there anyone that needs gluten free? Nobody's identifying that. Okay, that's fine. I have got gluten free cake in the kitchen if we needed it. So. This tradition, which is we're going to sing our grace, and the words are up on the board there, but it's a tune you know. It's a tune you know. It's com commonly known as the old 100th, but it's all creatures that on earth do dwell is the tune, so you'll know that one, won't you? Have all our people on the desk and everything got one? Yes, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we sing together. Pass the loving cup, and these you can drink straight away, but we maintain silence during this time.
pray together. Lord Jesus, here around your table sharing the loving cup, the love feast cake, thinking on your great love for us and our love for you. We pour out our hearts into this moment of devotion, looking for your grace, only your grace. Amen. And so we're going to sing again uh, another traditional hymn, but one that again really speaks to my heart and I hope to yours. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. It's about that, not just that beginning moment of your first experience and your testimony, but actually get travelling on every day, every moment, every hour. <laughs> get you to do something and that's why I'd like you to turn to your neighbour or to someone near to you and just to share your responses to God's grace this week just something that's happened that's reminded you about God might have been one of those little God incidences or 
something that somebody said to you, it might be a dream or a vision you've had, it might be just one of those things that happens, you know, one of those life events, but something that's made you think, oh, thank you, God, and that you want to say thank you, God, right this minute. So I'll give you a few seconds. I know what usually happens is there's a long period of silence, and then people start to talk, and then I can't stop you. Okay, so be, be aware it's only a five-minute exercise. Yeah. you to share your things with with me now you can talk about it more over coffee after we have the, the end of the service but it's just about we sometimes don't always grasp hold of those god moments or sometimes we don't we don't live in them we don't inhabit them they kind of fly past us and actually we need we need to remember them we need to hold them we need to be in that moment and think, thank you, God. So now we're going to pray. We're going to pray for other people and for ourselves, for those in need. And there will be moments of silence when you can think about people that perhaps are on your mind or your heart particularly. But I'm going to think, especially today, about those who are unable to attend church. So, let us pray. Loving God, as we come together in this place, we bring you our thanks for this place where week by week we can come and share fellowship. For this church, dedicated to worshipping you and for this time set aside from the daily tasks of life so that we can offer you our praise so that we can reflect on your word and seek your will we thank you for everything our coming here has meant and continues to mean Lord of the Church, unite us through the love of Christ. But we pray now for those who, for a variety of reasons, are unable to worship with us. Those confined to their homes. Those no longer fit enough to get out and about those in hospital, those who have to work on Sundays, those looking after loved ones. Lord of the Church, unite us through the love of Christ. 
we pray too for those who have drifted away. Drifted away from regular attendance. Those who have lost their faith or joined other churches or moved to a new area among new people. Lord of the church, unite us through the love of Christ. Loving God, may each of these, our friends, know that they are still much remembered, much valued and much cared about. May we find ways of expressing our concern, showing our support, and expressing our interest in their welfare, whatever their situation. May they know you close by their side, joined with us and all your people in the fellowship which only Christ can bring. Lord of the Church, unite us through the love of Christ, in whose name we pray, Amen. And Father God, we pray for all those situations around the world. Too many, so numerous, we can't remember and list them all. But every single one of them known to you. And so in a moment of quiet, we cry out to our Father God for peace in his world. Lord Jesus, we pray for the work of all those nations who seek peace. All those people who have gifts and graces of leadership and authority. We ask that your Holy Spirit will move in their hearts to bring peace and stability to the world, all the nations of the world. That all of those who are given great power will also feel the great responsibility of looking after your people. We pray for our community for all those in any kind of need or trouble. We pray for our families and friends, those who we know are in need of a helping hand and those who perhaps struggle on without saying a word about not managing or not being well. Those who smile and say, I'm okay. We pray a blessing on them. And lastly, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will be close to each one of us. That you will lift us up, give us strength, enthusiasm, energy and courage to be ambassadors for God and Jesus in this day and this age. Because we have only one thing that we can rely on. Christ's love. Showing the love of God. And so 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bring to you all our prayers, gathered up in the prayer which Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Do you bring forward your offering box for a blessing? Thank you. Lord, we bring our gifts, both these gifts given as cash here today, but also those given as card payments or promised as direct debits and standing orders and all those things that happen with banks and building societies and savings accounts. Father, you know our gifts. We want to offer them to you for you to bless them again. We dare to ask that you will bless them again to your work, for your kingdom. Bless the gift and bless all that we keep so that that also will be used to your glory, all that we are. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to sing our final hymn which for me rounds up the whole message of the Christian gospel. In Christ alone, my hope is found.
And so we bless one another as we share in the traditional words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. I just want to check, were there any children that went out? Mm, excellent. 
as we have tea and coffee before we go on our way. Thank you.